Earlier this year, CASU members had the opportunity to attend a conversation between Dillis Jackson and Emma Jelliot, illustrated with photographs of Dillis' life and work. Described by Robert MacDonald as one of Wales' most daring artistic explorers, Dillis has agreed to reprise her conversation with friend and arts journalist Emma Jelliot in her home surroundings. Their talk picks up the themes and issues from their previous conversation and brings it up to date. Okay, Dillis, so we are going to start with your formative years, which took place in what was then Ceylon, but is now Sri Lanka, obviously. Can you talk a bit about the effect of growing up in a place like that on, on you and on the way you thought or looked at things? Yes, I <clears throat> think that, you know, um, looking back, I can think about that. Of course, at the time, I was just there, as, as a child is. So the uh, top left-hand um, image is of uh, myself and, and my brother with topies, uh, cork, cork hats to keep off the strong sunlight. And you can see the sunlight, um, how um, uh, clear the difference is between um, shadow and light. And I think that looking back, that might that might have been really effective um, for me of, um, in how I saw the world, that everything was very clear. Um, we went to, uh, we went to Africa uh, for three years, uh, evacuated in fact, and came back to Sri Lanka. And um, so the photograph in the middle bottom is um, myself and sister, and we are there sitting on a, a remains of a, some um, great building in a place we live called Anurandapura which was full of the remains of temples, palaces, and baths. And um, on the right, you see um, a little bit of one of those remains with what's called a moonstone um, carved with elephants, lions, and all sorts of other um, wonderful creatures, uh, such as the elephants that you see above. So the elephants were an everyday, sort of occurrence in those times. And you began drawing the world around you at a very early age. Here's an example coming up. Was being an artist something you aspired to? Or something yeah. that you found that was inevitable? <laughs> yes, when, when we came back to, to Sri Lanka, to, to Anuradhapura, um, uh, Ceylon, um, my mother taught my sister and myself at home and she taught us via um, an organization called Parents National Educational Union, um, which gave curriculum and lesson plans to parents um, so that they could teach their children. And one of the lessons, of course, was drawing or art. And um, so if, uh, I, my, I can remember one of the lessons was about how to draw a a flower, I think it was a daisy, in fact, I know it was a sort of daisy type flower. And um, so my mother, um, through this, through the lesson plan, um, taught us about, or certainly me, about gestalt. In other words, that if you're going to look at the world, you look at, and you want to draw something from it, transfer from uh, 3D onto a flat plane, you look at its silhouette, the gestalt. And um, that, I can remember, was a sort of a very important lesson for me to learn. But another matter was that um, I did, um, I had a facility in drawing. Um, this one of the birds, it is a dead bird. It looks dead because it was dead. Um, and, um, and I drew anything that I was asked to draw, palm trees and so on and so forth. Um, and the adults around, um, my parents and others, um, I can remember um, saying how marvelous my my drawing was, and that I, you know, was very skilled. Um, I hadn't considered myself in that way, of course, as a child, and um, but when I was uh, got this sort of uh, go ahead and sort of way from adults, it decided me that that was what I was going to be when I when I grew up was going to be an artist, and that's never changed. Yes, and then you moved from the age of seven. Sorry, to yeah, sorry, no, 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 <laughs> no, because um, you obviously moved back to um, Cambridge, actually, didn't you? From, yes, um, Salon. 
and you carried on developing your artistic skills and sometimes outside of school. Can you talk a little bit about where you are in this picture? Yes, this is um, uh, on a Saturday, art class as, as we call them, um, at Homerton College in Cambridge, which is a very famous um, college, teacher training college. And um, the person who organised the art side was somebody called Melzi, we all called her Miss Melzi. And um, I think she called herself Jane Melzi, but I um, don't know her actual first name. Um, she was very, very well known and she organised for the student teachers to um, do extra um, work on the Saturdays if they wished. And that gave opportunity for um, young people like myself to have more training in different kinds of art forms and different ways of thinking from school. And we've also got some early examples of your 3D work. Yes. <laughs> Do you know to talk <laughs> about these a bit? Yes, well, the, the, <laughs> the puppy dog was actually brought into Honiton College, I think, mm -hmm. by one of the students and uh, put on the, the floor and the little sort of pen thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we were asked to um, make its portrait in clay, and uh, which was something, uh, you know, clay was pretty well the one medium that we used in school, as well as, as there for, for making 3D work. And the other one is um, a washerwoman in France, um, went to France with a school friend and her family and uh, saw this person washing by. And uh, so I just made a, an image of her. And the washing's lost, of course, you can see. <laughs> She's was wringing her hand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's not wringing her hand, she's <laughs> wringing what she's meant to be. So, yeah. But I mean, clearly these skills were sort of pointing you towards something. And we're going to look at you now in the Slade years when you went to. Yes, the Slade, I went to the Slade straight from school. Um, and this was uh, not usual, although in my year there were a few other people who'd come students who'd come from school, but mostly the students had come from other art colleges, so they were um, more senior and experienced and so on. Um, but it was a very academic uh, training yeah, indeed, and um, also it was a time of, of um, beatniks and flower power, so you see me in my statutory donkey jacket and should have black stockings, I don't think I did, I think it was actually summertime. <laughs> so, uh, Yes. Yes, and uh, that's an example of some of the um, life drawing that we had to do in uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of um, life drawings throughout, throughout the four years I was there. But although um, I did move into the sculpture department later, I think I don't know really want to. Yeah, and that, that's that's um. Uh, we were able to move into um, studios where the, the pose was longer and then you could actually um, get down to some uh, using paint. And uh, so this is what this is, it's five five week pose they were called. And uh, so it was, it was a very exciting time, you know, and met a whole lot of, of um, people who were, you know, fellow students as well as uh, tutors. Um, like tutors, uh, Mike Gombrich, for instance, who taught, taught history of art. Um, and he blunt came and gave some lectures on Poussin. And, uh, and Henry Moore was meant to visit once a year, but I uh, don't know if he actually did because nobody seemed to have seen him. That's <laughs> <laughs> a myth, perhaps. Um, and yes. Kokoschka, yes, yes, yes. yes. Kukoshka that's Kukoshka right. we, we talked about Kokoschka before. Um, yes, it was very exciting. Um, one of the students, Patrick Proctor, in fact, um, sadly died some years ago, but he um, uh, decided he would do some um, organising of, of uh, getting artists to come and visit and talk. Um, so he, he he arranged for Kokoschka, Oscar Kokoschka, to come and talk. Uh, very exciting. We all gathered in the, the common room with our peanut butter sandwiches and cups of tea and um, uh, waited for the great man to, to arrive. And uh, he eventually did, door open, there he was. 
and uh, there was silence. People waited for the the talk he was going to give us, and he actually only said one thing. He went his one sentence. Let's say he said, "If you want to see, look," and uh, that's been a really important. Um, instruction, if you like, that um, all artists, I think, should should uh, think about. When you left the kind of the cocoon of, of art school, you had to be quite pragmatic about how you continued your practice as an artist. And if you were finding materials in odd places, um, experimenting with different media, wood, marble, plastic, and in fact, metal doll that sort of expandable ducting at one point, I think. But you were also training to be a teacher and bringing up two sons. So how challenging was all that? <laughs> that was a matter of uh, um, organisation, I think, really, that, um, you know, when, when children were there, um, they had to be fed, etc. And one wanted to so do, of course. <laughs> so and um, so the, the um, uh, work... Uh, as a sculptor, which is what I became most interested in, in the slave, spent uh, most of my years there in the in the sculpture department, in fact. And um, so this is this is an image of a um, part of a an oak tree root that um, uh, were left when when they reforested the cut down the deciduous trees and and, and um, planted trees for pit props in the war, I suppose. And um, so the, the, um, there were a lot of these old bits of wood left around in the forest. Um, and I used those. This one's called Owl, and it was bought by Dame Irene White for Colleague Harleff. And this is the, the, the forest you're talking about were in uh, above the Neath, or in the Neath Valley, weren't they? Yes, they were about, the about, yes time, above yeah. Neath Abbey, that's yeah. right. Yes, this is where I'm at. That's a good time. Mm -hmm. And then we, we moved to, to Penarthen Farrets. And this is um, a, an off cut from um, Woodyard, Sipili. It's a piece of Sipili. And um, that's an off cut from the owl. That's off cut from the monumental masons um, by throwing away their bits of marble into the quarry, unless you were there in time. And then you could um, pick them up in your farm or whatever. Ooh. Mm. Probably still do. People are interested. <laughs> this is the flexible ducting that uh, that you mentioned, um, and I quite I very much enjoyed using this. I was trying to find some sort of material that could make the kinds of forms that I was making actually in bronze at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, the the good thing about this is, um, is flexible ducting is that you could squash it all up into a flat pack, if you like, and mm -hmm. put it in the boot of your car. And, and un unroll it, and, and it made quite a, um, uh, an exciting sort of statement because of you know its appearance and size, I suppose. Yeah. And, um, and here I was using um, leather, and I started. I was interested in um, groups. Started to be interested in groups and individuals, and how you know, uh, sort of a membrane skin, as you like. Um, encloses a group so you can be in or out, but it, within the group there are individuals, and so this is what this this work uh, was about. This is quite a large piece, actually. I was going to say, no, for as long as we've known each other, which is, I'm trying not to think about it, but it is over 50 you were years. Very young. I was very young, but it was over 50 years ago. <laughs> And as far back as I can remember, you've always had a studio space of some description. So how important do you think it is to separate the workspace from the home space, even if one is physically in the other? I, th I think it's I think it's very important because you need to um, uh, be thinking your own thoughts, really, to put it very simply. Um, I, I don't like any noise where I work uh, in the way of radio or anything like that. So I, I need to feel um, cut off. So um, even if it's a very small space, space uh, so I have in this present house, not, not the one in the picture, um, uh, it's 
you know, it's um, I can be on my own because the whole house is my own. <laughs> but there, uh, in that, um, that was a, a sort of front room upstairs in the terrace house, and um, uh, I could just I used it mainly, as you see, for drawing. Right, I'm conscious of that we're covering a very, very long career and we're doing it in, in chunks. So yes. I'm going to leap right. mm -hmm. to something that I think had a very, well, I think had a very big impact on a lot of us, but it clearly had a big impact on you. And that was the Peace Camp at Green and Common. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, the, for those who don't know, it was a peaceful protest led by women far and wide. <clears throat> Um, which gained global attention really about the, the presence of American cruise missiles on UK soil. Um, but, but your visits to that peace camp led to a really powerful body of work and some of it you can see it kind of evolving as, as we'll go through the next batch of images. Can you talk about how this these images evolved particularly and the certain yes. Um, yes, the mm. uh, th this was uh, not in the first usage because they didn't have the watchtowers then. Um, the first visit was really about the fence and people mm. taking um, objects and attaching them to the fence to say mm. these are important to me. Um, but this particular one is of a watchtower and um, they had started to put um, razor wire rolls inside and build these very cranky sort of watchtowers, which were not obviously not ones that anybody would want to actually go and stand in because they were, they were very rickety and um, corrugated iron blowing in the wind and all that sort of thing. But they were clearly meant to be aggressive. And as any watchtower is, it's my, you know, we're looking at you sort of thing. So um, they were and uh, very aggressive sort of statements. Um, and I made a tremendous number of drawings and paintings of this because I, um, I wanted to work really fast to get all the um, matters about that, that um, event out as uh, quickly as possible. And here, as you see, the, the idea of the threat um, and, and aggression is uh, sort of translated into, into um, a bird of prey, if you like. And, um, and the corrugated, this is a collage, the corrugated iron is actually corrugated cardboard. So I'm collaged on this. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, and this is sort of going back a bit because that's, mm -hmm. that's a fence piece. And so this these are um, sort of wraiths, I call them W-R-A-I-T-H, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which uh, like the sort of, um, not the actual women, but they're, they're the, their thoughts and, and, and considerations and uh, uh, and sorrow really about what was happening the other side of the fence. And there again, this, this is about things hanging, uh, hanging off the fence. Okay, we're going to do another kind of something. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to be very bouncy this time. Well, this is a whole. I do work in series, so <laughs> that was part of the series. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. Um, Another thing that I know has been a big chunk of your life for the last, I'm not going to think about, four Sometimes decades, at least four decades, yeah. uh, was the development and your very, very deep involvement in um, what was to become the Women's Arts Association. And at that, at the time that it started in the 80s, women artists were barely visible, um, pretty much written out of art history and often left feeling cut off, unsupported and isolated. So can you talk about how the Women's Arts Association, one of the few organisations actually from that time that's still going, can you talk about how it came about and why? Yes, it came about um, from, um, uh, here are some of us, and we <laughs> had some staff, which seems, and there'll be some people there who, who um, council members will, will recognise. Um, yes, it came about because a women's committee was formed by the then the Mor South Morgan um, council and um, county council and the women's committee within it there was a decision um, that there should be various discussion groups um, sort of spinning off from from the committee and um, women in health women in education and women in the arts so um, 
Diane Setch was asked to um, formulate the discussion group, if you like, with Julie Morgan, the councillor. There always had to be a councillor in each group, of course. Um, and so uh, Diane Setch ran around a few friends and five of us uh, met uh, to discuss. And one of the things, one of the matters we thought we should uh, try and uh, organise as a festival of women in the arts, not not uh, women artists, but, but any woman creating in any art form and, and have a festival because we did feel, as you say, that a lot of women uh, and still do live quite isolated lives because of being cared as carers, not just for children, but often for um, uh, adults, you know, parents and so on. And um, so we wanted to um, say to women, you know, bring your stuff at least for a day and let's see what you're doing and let's share the fun. And so the Women's Arts Festival started and they became huge um, so that they were running from um, February to April and we had Mo Mo then speaking to us and more of Telly and so on and so forth. Um, Sean Phillips opened one of our exhibitions and I could go on and on. So it's very grand. Um, now we, we don't have the, um, we developed so that we um, had some funding, but then that funding was removed in, 20, in 2010. And um, so now we're back to where we started, really, which was volunteers. And here are some of us. Um, uh, Tate Modern in the um, first exhibition there, uh, which had um, uh, Louise Bourgeois' work in the turbine hall. So it's a woman's work in uh, that prestigious place and site within that prestigious place. So we organised a, a charaban trip and uh, so there we went. It is worth mentioning that the room we're sitting in is full of the most impressive collection of monographs and, and collected writings about women artists that, that I think probably exists in Wales, if, if, if anywhere. At least, um, I would say they're about 300 now. Yeah. Yes, which is uh, it's pretty amazing. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, I thought. Yes, <laughs> anybody interested in <laughs> <at> them? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, oh yes, this is one of the most recent projects that mm -hmm. um, the Women's Arts Association of Wales um, did, which is a banner um, for to celebrate 100 years of women's suffrage. Paraded through Cardiff with with other banners and so on, and it is now in the collection of the. Um, in St. Fagans, the Museum of Welsh Life. So we're very pleased with that. Yes, oh, that's marvellous. Well, we're going to gloss over an entire career of teaching and take you back to art school again. When um, you went back to Cardiff School, went to Cardiff School of Art and Design to do an MA, which coincided with the first Gulf War and again led to some very powerful images. So again, um, I'd like you to describe how some of these works came about. Yes, well, they, they are all anti-war. And I suppose that it comes, you know, uh, from the, um, um, you know, the, the Green and Common um, experiences and, and what was happening in the world anyway. Um, so when I did the MA, I think it's called the Cardiff Institute. University Institute of Cardiff. University yeah, Institute of Cardiff. It's had WRC. lots of different names. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at, at the time, but it was, which was in Howard Gardens. The Arts oh. College was in the Howard Gardens then. Um, so this is a piece that's made of um, small um, plastic toys that are tanks and guns and so on and so forth. And the, the image before that was, uh, again, the birds of prey, which mm -hmm. you know, came from Greenham experience, I suppose. And this is really your first foray into making installation work as well. And you did it at quite a scale, it has to be said, <laughs> because this work is huge. Would you like to? It, it, it was, was, it was, uh, it mm. was huge. Um, it, it, it's for sure, it's called Renoir's, which stands mm. for ready-made war scenarios. Um, so the idea was that um, could you not produce a whole lot of the victims of war and send them around the world and, and um, make scenarios of the war. So no, nobody would actually get killed. But so, so in, in 
this is about 15 foot by eight foot high. I can't remember how mm -hmm. that. That's seen from the other direction, as it mm -hmm. were. So e each of these of the boxes contains um, uh, notionally um, a, a, an image that's that's around. So the great woman is from a, a print by um, Katie Colvich. Um, the one which we see here, the back is the back of kneeling man, and he has dead child box in front of him. Then there's mourning woman, this attacking soldier that was in the um, uh, uh, photograph of the dying soldier who's just been shot from the um, Spanish um, Civil War, for instance. Um, so they're all um, uh, containing, if you know, well-known victims, if you like. Uh, and we, we move to sort of site specific work which you experimented again during your MA. Yes. So this is outside. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. So um this is in uh, Lower Machen churchyard, and these are um in a line with with um tombstones, and they are as it were sort of victims again. Um and this one is called again. It was in the same same place, same time. Proclamation, and uh, it covers the stump of a pre preaching cross. It's a box, and it just doesn't damage the stump in any way. And the idea was it reflected the sky because the preaching crosses were meant to where the pre priest brought proclaimed um, um, God and brought God down to earth, as it were, by proclamation. So that's what the Reflection is about in that one. And the war theme, I think you've got. Yes, I mean, it's got very dark. Dogs of war. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the um, very much from the Gulf War, that one. And that one is as well, victim of uh, um, various. When the, the war ended, they found where they had been torturing people. So I know a whole series of that. Uh, this is uh, from a series of derelict war memorials, um, derelict because I, uh, for me, I didn't want war memorials to need to exist anymore. So that one it was in the um, Women Artists' Diary. It was on the cover. Okay, so obviously, the, you know, you're, you're very aware of what's going on around you in the world, but also I think... The natural world has had a, a really big and profound effect on the way that you make work and you did a lot of traveling and i think it'd be really good to talk about how some of the things you picked up because you've you've been all over the place really um but there are some things that you teased out that there's, there's some commonalities or some themes that you pulled out of, of landscapes that have kind of translated into the way that you made works particularly some of your drawings or your your almost 3D drawings, I mm. suppose, would be mm. the same. Mm. So, yes, yeah, yeah. some of them have been translated into sculpture, for instance, mm. Monument Valley, and so there are quite a few sculptures um, about the, that sort of the rocky protuberances, if you mm. like, and um, pinnacles. And um, the, this is Ayers Rock or Uluru, and uh, this generated some um, sort of installation work, sort of large box, these box things, um, but in a way you can't get it big enough. <laughs> and um, I did so again, I made a whole series of um, drawings and paintings um, and prints about um, the rock uh, on a particular day when in fact it rained quite extraordinarily and you could see how the the water over the millennia had had carved the rock um and run down and made gullies in it and um I suppose it was those those gullies those splits and whatnot that uh within they, the rock they come i mean this is a yeah. man-made <clears throat> Rift was uh, but it's quite a, quite a powerful kind of shape in a in a yeah very yeah. Arid landscape. Yes, and, and so uh, this and and other drawings that I was starting more to make um, did 
and in fact photographs and so on but this is again another drawing this is um Curry Goldgood mm -hmm. and I was interested in in how that sort of central split um uh, um echoes um a sort of kinesthetic experience as uh, uh, as Barbara Hepworth described it with the land in other words you, you feel um, the shape of things because we feel our own body we only exist um, all that we know is within within our skin uh, and um, so we what we see around us we 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 own we relate to what we are and our personal body as well not just physically of course but also mentally but physically very much um, and again that's an, another rule and it shows this central split which i feel is a very uh, for me is the feminine um, central mm -hmm. line of my body and again, that one. And, and that one too, anyway, this is um, uh, uh, sort of trying to get it into solid, as it were, those are drawings. Um, and this is a rock from Omani Desert, actually, and with a, a line uh, of bronze in the ceramic, which um, again has this um, run as it's not just the split but also liquid running down those the, the center and again that one which is the same and then different colored rocks on the Mani desert are quite extraordinary some of them are green orange black brown deep red and it's a very silent place I think that's what I like about. I, mm. I enjoy deserts because they are silent, I think. This is also, I think, when you started experimenting with combining different kinds of material. Yes, that's right. This <clears> is very I mean, and that's been a I mean, experimenting with material has been, you know, kind of central to what you do. You know, have always done but stuff, this yes. this com this combination of things and trying pushing things to see what they'll do. Yes, yes. And um you were lucky enough to get a, a, a masterclass grant from the Welsh Arts Council as well. Oh no, was it that? It was probably the Arts Council of Wales yes, by that point. Yes, yes. Um, and you made your first experiments with casting metal. So yes. how did that process change the way that you work? <clears throat> I, I think um, very much because, um, because of process. And um, it is uh, fascinating to... Uh, be, to make uh, the mold and the matrix again and that for me is a sort of female or well, it's not a female thing necessarily but but the containment uh, that we think of with female bodies because of the childbirth you know containing mm -hmm. um, um is there within the mold matrix system of making the mold getting the, the object out and so on um and uh the so it works i'm just doing were made from three just three um, molds um, an open donut a closed donut and a column and so I made these and um, took that shape out of uh, the mold many times in wax cut it up and then reconstituted into the shapes that's making which were very much the sort of uh, my thinking on the sort of interaction of male and female if you like that sometimes in in um, opposition and sometimes uh, in in cooperation cooperation and um such as sort of running through those sort of shapes and it's uh, yes yeah, so casting um is a fascinating mm -hmm. i just found it a fascinating process um, now, up to this point, we've probably given the impression that your life has been one of glitter and glamour and it's all <laughs> been, you know, just one non-stop private view and a canopy and glasses. And, but, but the reality is a little bit more <laughs> different, particularly when um, you became a community yes. artist for oh, sorry, community. An environmental artist. Environment. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> no, I, um, when I stopped um, uh, teaching in uh, special schools, um, I got um, um, 
few, uh, a little residency, and then a larger one from the Arts Council. And this one was a residency with um, Groundwork, Groundwork Regend, Groundwork Trust, um, where you were working um, uh, in the community with people in areas that were had been decimated by um, uh, industry being there and then going. So the rivers were, were uh, not uh, clean enough for fish to survive, for instance. The land was was um, dead in places. And, <coughs> and what was more important than all that, of course, was that the people had no jobs. So the, when, when um, industry finishes, the, the, the people are, are sort of left high and dry in a lot of ways. Um, so anyway, this was uh, so we, we did a lot of work with people who wanted their, their world to be different. This is um, a project called Brick Benches, which were all the way up the um, Ogmore Valley. And um, so children and young people carved um, bricks, not, not fired ones, unfired ones, and then they were fired and put together. Um, this is in a place called Gubetus. Um, this is the fish here, the, is actually my work, all the rest of it wasn't my work, it was the work that I helped other people to, to make. Um, and the fish was there because it was um, the weather vane on the church, um, it was quite rare to have a fish rather than a cockerel or whatever on the weather vane. Um, this is one of the brick benches in the Ockham Valley, this is in Wind Windham. Um, each bench was about the uh, particular area, and there had been a, a mine there, of course, called the Wyndham. Somebody actually, quite soon after this was made, it's a mine and his wife, obviously, it's a whippet and a cat, and um, somebody um, scored with uh, felt pen on, on it somewhere or other, and uh, there was outrage from the people of Wyndham, and they said, nobody, nobody is to touch our bench. I don't know if that still exists, but at the time, it, uh, they, uh, it was their bench. This this is one that's um, uh, further down Valley Glangina, and um, there was um, a railway line there with a viaduct and so on, so that was a bit of fun to me. But it's easy to, um, I suppose, to get swept away with the day-to-day -day projects of a multi-stranded program like because you were very much embedded in the organization groundwork but also in the communities you were working with so it's important isn't it really to be able to step back sometimes and kind of refresh your practice and take stock and you um got a, a BAMF residency in Canada um as part of the, your Leighton fellowship is that right I think. that's what they were called yes they were called mm. the Leighton fellowships Right. Yes, <laughs> but that seems to have provided you with a lot of rocket fuel for when you came back to Wales. So I'm wondering if you could describe a bit what it was like being there and what you took from it. Well, mm. um, it, it was pretty wonderful being there. This is my studio, which is actually um, the uh, head of department studio. He was away for the time that I was there. So uh, it became my studio. And um, so I could look out on the, on the mountains and look down into the forests below and see all these wild animals and the snow and whatnot. Um, these drawings are um, layered collages of, of snow slightly melting on, on streams in the, in the canyons. But I also did um, uh, some casting there. And what I took was um, molds of um, pine trees that had fallen and made, made a sort of rough um, surface, which again, I took lots of waxes out and combined that with the my previous um, waxes to make um, shapes that were the textured part could be water or it could be rock or whatever as was fascinating which it started off as sort of course this is uh, um uh, in the national museum of wales and purchased that one and this again uh, and this uh, sort of spins off the um the Ogmore valley in fact so the the shape the smooth shape is is um, a talon shape uh, there are a lot of um buzzards around 
and of course the water and, and the wind, always wind up the land, it's blowing the water. So that's what this comes from. And that one. So the rounded shapes of the um, Krygogor um, echoed in those shapes there. And that one. This is watershed because there was a watershed up at the top. This is another. Piece. Yes, this this piece um, again. It has the the the, the um, central split and the water, if you like. But that piece mm -hmm. I also made without the central bit, and that uh, which is in um, Edward Murray or Murray Edward. I never get that right. Um, college in Cambridge, which is the largest collection of women's art in the UK. Mm. Yeah. And here we come back to looking at the at the pinnacles and so on that's where right in um, in Monument Valley. And you've always been very physically involved with the making of your work, which isn't always the case with some artists. So how important is it to you to be really hands-on with the whole process? Oh, very very important. I think the touch, you know, the you as I said, you know, how, what do we know of the world? We know what's, you know, what we experience in our own bodies. So that the touch of things is, is, uh, you know, creates messages and information, and um, it's it's exciting. And and all this work with molds, um, you know, as I said before, I do find I find the process um, very interesting because in the end because of how we do it <laughs> as, as, as sculptors, particularly with cast iron, which is what this is about. Mm. Um, we, we do our own casting in, in groups and how successful or not <laughs> depends on a lot of matters like what the iron was that we melted and you know, whether it was hot enough or not or whether we made the mold correctly. And so it is very exciting up to the last minute when you break the mold and see what's happened. Yeah. What is it about iron particularly that, that appeals to you? Because um, the, the casting process, uh, you, you kind of cut your teeth on with bronze, but there's something else about iron and iron has been a recurring material, and especially in, since you, you brought together the Iron Maidens project. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I think the the uh, as I said before, the um, with our you know making our in South Wales as mm. artists sculptors, we are actually um, doing the whole process ourselves. We're not sort of sending away to a company. Um, so doing that meant that you you meet a tremendous lot of people. So in this in the UK and in America, I sort of across the Atlantic uh, many times uh, residencies doing residencies um, in um, casting and uh, so met a, a tremendous number of, of sculptors in that field and um, I decided <coughs> one one um, session which was in in uh, near Ipswich that there were a lot of women, um, particularly the US women and a few in, in South Wales at the time who were casting in, in iron and, and I wanted people to see that. So I, I got together uh, an exhibition which I called Iron Maidens and started off in uh, Lantana and Grange actually and then it showed in, in about five different venues in Wales, Barry and uh, in North Wales and once in England, and uh, then it went over to the US and showed in four, four different universities in the US. And, um, and Iron Maidens, as I say, went on until it started in 20, 2009 and it finished in 2014. So it had quite a, a long history. Uh, it, is now, and it is now a group. So Iron Maidens 2 is not an exhibition, it's a group. Mm -hmm. And that has now recently formed in, in Wales of Welsh uh, women working in, in Wales and cast iron. So that's doing its biz. This is this is um, aluminium and iron. Aluminium experiment. 
equipment and fabulous things. Um, and also we're starting to get the organic forms that will start to emerge as we carry on. Drawing has always been very integral to what you do. And um, sometimes you really appear to be pushing the line between drawing and object making. Um, as can be seen with some of these slides that are coming up now. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of the ideas for the, the drawings we're going to look at next have been sparked by responses to places you visited when you were travelling. Yeah. But how do you make that move from 2D to 3D as a as an idea progresses? Well, yes, I mean, and um, this was this was in Iceland, and it's a crater, as you say, and um, actually it's a pseudo crater. And then we're actually again that's in yeah. Iceland, and the um, the so the paper had to be the surface of the of the land, if you if you like, because you couldn't make anything as big as the crater <laughs> without making the crater itself. Um, so how to describe how to um, um, describe or sort of get across the excitement of what you were seeing? You had to I regarded the paper as the sculptural surface as a thing, whatever it was. If it was made of metal or whatever, but paper actually is very um, um, good to use because the central bit of this, for instance, um, I put a um, uh, wet tissue on on the center of the paper overnight, and so in the, in the morning to dry, but it had expanded, so that was the where the geyser, if you like, starts to push up through the through the earth. Through the rock about it, and this again is um, um, what's called a pseudo crater where where the um, lava flows over a wet land, and super the the super steam breaks up, if you like, through the still slightly molten lava and creates these craters. Another one. Again, the paper is torn and cut, and so there'll be two layers of paper there. So that's the there's a very black piece of black paper behind. Um, something about looking down to the center of the earth or something. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are things like the geysers, which sort of come up and as so just sort of blob of white, and then you just wait there while this blob sort of grows and grows, and then mm. suddenly bang, you know. Like, it shoots out, and um, so again, there was this idea of, of um, this. This is not manipulated paper. This is a drawing that is manipulated paper. That's that's split. So again, it's going back to the central sort of split idea. Um, but I was also looking at, in South America, Mexico, actually, and um, some of the images of, of um, people there um, in, in plaster, which has lasted hundreds of years. And um, there was something about how they um, uh, cut themselves, if you like, um, uh, cutting their teeth even to put little jewels in their teeth. Mm -hmm. And also making stones that act that fit so beautifully against each other, fast stones, and that um, rang rang with my the split idea. So Palenque was um, where I saw a lot of these plaster works, of, um, and the split um, you you can't see in this image, but um, the paper behind. There's another piece of paper behind, which is gold, so you can just see to the gold. Um, and again, this is using paper um, uh, as as a as a sculptural medium, if you like, and squeezing it up together. It's just as would happen with with rock, for instance, being pressurized and folded. And the same with that one. And that one. It's back to. I saw them again. No, another <laughs> sideways jump. <laughs> Sorry, we are going all over the place. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of 
home in a bit on your first explorations of the tiny, often overlooked aspects of the natural world. And can you tell us how it yes. started, particularly with these? Yes, well, it, um, in a way, if you, these are sort of uh, run on from, from the previous ones in a way, mm -hmm. because what is interesting, these are uh, lithoids and they are um, very tiny cactuses that look like pebbles. But when I saw them, I was in queue looking at these enormous um, Henry Moore sculptures, went into Green, you know, one of the glass houses, and there was this tray of pebbles. But some of the pebbles were these tiny, tiny little um, cactuses, which some of them were flowering. So the one on the right, for instance, is very typically what they look like when they flower, and they have little flowers on top of this. Thing. And so from that came this idea of a container, if you like, with something sprouting out of it, and, um, which evolved into sculpture as well. So again, it's all about this form of the central split, if you like, and growth. So I suppose it was it's starting to be positive, so not a sort of about war and destruction, but about life mm. and things that grow. And um, this one was uh, again using um, some of the um, mold I've made with bark and whatnot to to make um, a piece that um, hang off the the valleys. Really, I've made a whole lot of. Um, pieces that, that were like just the top bit of this, if you like, that hollowed with, with um, the bronze running down. So this is steel and bronze. Mm -hmm. And um, it was sort of echoed in that, in that um, there's, there's, so you get the mountain on top, as it were, but, but it all comes from down deep, down in the earth. And so I call this one Hirais. This one is in um, uh, the... Uh, Sculpture Park, it's just called the Sculpture Park, I think, <coughs> near Church in Surrey. And uh, which but on the left, it was up in Leicester, in the Botanic Gardens in Leicester, and then it was taken and now purchased by Eddie Powell of, of um, Evervale, who runs the Sculpture Park in Surrey. And that's where it is on the right. And I think it's, it's quite important to, that you're your work behaves differently in different contexts as well. And I think, um, you know, with your early explorations in Lohmachen, for example, uh, the, but just looking at these two images side by side, you can see how different the same work is in two different contexts. And you have made other site-specific works like Paradoi, uh, which you made for Coit Hill, uh, Coit Hills Rural Arts Space, trips off the tongue, which is a very specific response to a particular site which couldn't go anywhere else. Whereas this, the, the work that we're looking at now, can actually operate in different environments, but and and become a, become something else. And it's still essentially the same sculpture, but it it takes on a different kind of meaning with that thing around it. So, do you think it's um, do you have to think differently when you're making work for an unknown final location? And when you're making work for a particular set of site-specific circumstances, um, in some ways, I mean, the um, if you go back to, I can't go back. You can't. Go back. <laughs> I haven't got the technology. Okay, the previous <laughs> previous one we showed. Up here I I chose where that work should go in the botanic gardens, but when it went to down to um, Church, um, Eddie Powell positioned it where he saw it in, in the woods mm. and. And uh, that pleases me because a lot of the um, larger works that I make, I do see as being right to be out in, in land. And uh, so I positioned these two, which are called spikes. Um, and I like to see those growing out of, out of um, uh, you know, plant, plant life, if you like, appearing out of, out of bushes. And... Um, Although though they started life as a sort of um, lava pinnacles, if you like, um, but they they for me they do sort of relate to something appearing out of greenery. 
And this is the one that couldn't be anywhere else, really. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this one is, um, spells in Morse code. It spells uh, the um, artery, the gateway, and it runs, and, and, it's, and um, it's, I call it the message. It runs from an oak tree down behind us, as it were, as we look at this image, um, over the hills towards the <coughs> television mask in St. Hilary. So it was a message, and it was there for many years, actually, and the cows used to like to rub themselves. <laughs> and you, you could actually see it from the air, because I, I flew to um, to Ireland and, and uh, from, from Cardiff Airport and looked down, and there it was, rather like the... Yeah. Uh, Yes, a sort of great wall of China, mm. not exactly seen from space, but <laughs> seen from, from a, an easy get <laughs> <laughs> um, And also, you, see, you spent a lot of time working in the, the South Wales Valleys, and it seemed to, uh, that kind of context seems to bring together lots of strands of your, I think, because of the topography as yes, much as the community. Yes, yes, yes. So can you tell us a little bit about those kind of elements? Oh, yes. Um, the, uh, when I was talking about Hirath, for instance, these came before Hirath. Um, and there, there are, um, th this, this valley work is a Garu Valley, which is a very long, narrow uh, valley. And so I had this feeling of, of um, uh, this restriction, as it were, um, going up it and uh, made a, a series of works. Um, these are, are steel and bronze, but I also have wood and bronze. It's a little one, kind of a house, so it has the that <laughs> extra side. But again, it's sort of, it's a valley's house, you know, it has this, the um, river running always running down through the middle yeah and we come to more recent bodies of work which look at i mean the the, the cacti were tiny but these things are minuscule because quite often and this is a cog that you're um some of the pollens you've worked on are microscopic and it's quite a lot to do with they're quite joyous anyway, because they are essentially pollen is to do with sex really isn't it yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well these, these are pods. these are these are pods, the pods but yeah the, the, the yes exactly yeah. yes yeah. So pods and pollens actually yeah. are very when you're looking yeah. at images of them um you know, some of them are very uh, similar it's just hard yeah. to tell the difference because they do relate to each other you know so they, this kind of pod is it is Sort of relate, it's rather like that enormous Coco de Mer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I should love a Coco de Mer. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I tried to buy one from somebody once in, in Ragland. She had some in her window. She wouldn't sell them. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this again is a pod. Yeah. And then we're starting to get onto the, get even smaller now mm. into, into the pollens. And this was looking at. Um, uh, the pollen again using paper as as the sculptural medium if you like and and looking at uh, the kind of network pollens where you can look inside there's something inside and you don't know what it is so i want it to be sort of uh, glittery and gold and precious you know so th this paper is probably about five layers of of paper and cut into um different um size holes so that you are drawn to looking at down there's the gold in the background which may yes. be very clear yeah. and sometimes it's gold and mm. sometimes it's um i use mm. bronze powder for instance mm. or sometimes i just make a, a very very um, dark you know the graphite mm. so again this that was probably about five layers of paper that one. Mm. and this one is, is um again the more fine delicate network sort of problems where you can see that there is something you don't know quite what it is, mm. <laughs> and uh, looking right through it. And uh, this is, again is the, the the sort of spiky pollens as well, and this is using a, a, a mold from um, Romanesco, taking lots of waxes out of the mold and then chopping them up and putting them together in a you know, 3D all round shape, if you like. And looking at the spiky pollens because there are spiky ones and network ones, very, mm. very roughly interrelated. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, um, this is one uh, very recent uh, work. And uh, so it's two apertures, one behind. And this is this pointed one, it's got three apertures. So pollens have um, apertures where they, the entrance and exits of reproduction happen. Yeah. It's sex, really, isn't it? There's sex, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's uh, that's one that was in um, the Botanical National Botanic Garden of Wales. And um, you can see the aperture there, that dog. And, uh, and this is a very spiky one that's the most recent one. And I don't know if you've got an image of the... Um, and this is... Um, I'm starting to learn about... Um, um, using a computer to produce images and this is a print 3d print of um, one of these spiky pollen things i've made recently and this is um, again back to bronze and this is uh, looking at just as a microorganism so it's not a pollen but looking at other kinds of organisms and protozoa and so on which is sort of all pops up when we're in the middle of um, you know, lockdown and, and viruses and so on. So I started to look at those very tiny things. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting, you know, for me, it's very important because all those tiny things have been um, on this planet. You know, there are fossils of it from millions and millions of years ago. And they'll probably go on existing after human beings don't exist anymore. <laughs> this is um, protozoa. Again, the, the pieces that I make about these microorganisms and very minute things um, are not portraits of them. So I, I use what I see of them in, in uh, obviously in images from uh, electron microscope, images printed off from them. And, um, and ones that you, know, you see on the television and so on, and it's wonderful programs that are made about life and the sea and so on. That's um, another one, and I just and I use them to make make these shapes. These are uh, reptilian almost, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these are very yes, all swimming together. These are very tiny ones, and they're all different from each other. This is, um, this is one that was in um, Duffin Gardens. Yeah. And as you see, um, you know, it's very specifically mm. to sit in vegetation yeah. as it's a pollen. Well, Dillis, we've covered a lot of ground today about your past career, but what have you got in the pipeline? Well, recently, I'm very proud to say that um, my commissioned work, Spiked Pollen 3, has been installed at Landor Hospital. And what's next then? Uh, what comes next is um, my interest in immortal jellyfish. Oh, yes, I can see you've carved a version out of lots of pages of a sketchbook. And, and now, very recently, I'm carving um, a marble version. Well, I can't wait to see how that develops. Dennis, it's been lovely wandering through your career as an artist, though I'm conscious we couldn't go into much detail because there's just so much of it. But thank you for a marvellous conversation and for letting me see your impressive library of more than 300 monographs on women artists. So thank you, Dennis.